every time I try to do something and tell, somebody tells me, this is not corporate, this is politics. And I say, nowhere in politics does it say that I have to be stupid. Right? I have, there, there, there's no requirement. I can still do intelligent things that doesn't make it corporate. You know, it, it was just fragments of conversation, but I hope it just opened uh, new doors for us. But next up is a conversation which is very much in the here and now with somebody who's at the heart of power as we recognize it. This is the Tamil Nadu uh, finance minister who is... <laughs> it's nice when a, when a political leader gets that kind of automatic claps, <laughs> you know. But he has a very interesting description of himself. He says that he's the finance minister of the largest, uh, one of the largest industrial states in the country, and yet he's seen as a dissenter. And that's because he's not a status quoist. He calls himself a change agent. And he has been speaking up about the nature of power in this country. He's been bringing up issues of federalism, the nature of the economy, and has repeatedly said that he wants to leave a system better than he found it. Unlike many other people in public life, he's well-placed to speak of these issues because he ha he's been an investment banker, he's an MIT topper, and he comes from a legacy of a rich legacy of a political family. He need not have undertaken the very difficult task of a public life, but he has. So to discuss what is the southern perspective on the country, we are in the north and we are very used to looking at the world from this northern perspective to bring us new perspectives on how to look on the economy, politics, and culture of our uh, country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome PTR Thyagrajan. I wanted to share just one little detail about Mr. Thyagrajan is that he is uh, so committed to that, you know, not just the projection of a life of probity, but to live it, that he never accepts any hospitality, no air tickets, no car from the airport, no room, no hospitality, and that runs across everybody who invites him. <laughs> So, Mr. Thyagrajan, first, thank you very much for making the time to come. But, you know, when, when we were speaking about Tamil Nadu, uh, typically in the north, we've had this south divide, and Priyanka Chopra lived that out a little embarrassingly right now when she said RRR was a Tamil film and it's a Telugu film, you know. So we just say the southerners, you know. But, but the south has a very uh, uh, animated uh, viewpoint on the, on the way the country is being run. Tamil Nadu is very interesting because it's gone from $80 billion to a $300 billion economy in, in just eight years. Um, I was reading that the Niti Aayog put out a multidimensional poverty index, and Tamil Nadu ranks just 4% of Tamil Nadu is considered poor by those standards, which is amazing. <laughs> and, and you draw just 3% of your revenues from the center. The rest is all generated by you, and your economy already equals Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, and you've set yourselves a task to reach one trillion. So that's to give framework that your words carry weight. So first, before we get to your perspectives, why did you want to give up your very cushy life as a banker and a MIT topper and come into public life? Well, I think, you know, it's very hard to uh, compare anybody with anybody else. Every life is very different. In my case, I think, I had a legacy, my father, my grandfather, my great-granduncle before him had all been in the Dravidian movement. Uh, we, we had a long legacy of being in public service in the area that we are from. And so I'm an only child, and so at some point I think I had this vision that my destiny was going to be to do this. So the real aberration, I say that unlike most people who try to find a path through life, I had a destination and I tried to find the most winding and circuitous 
way to get there. And so I had thirty years of doing many different things and studying many things and working in many places and many countries. And so the great luxury actually was the thirty years in between. Because in the long arc of history, uh, I think, you know, and, I, and I'm a rationalist, I'm also a believer. But in some broader sense, I was with my son in the temple uh, two, three days ago in Madurai. I go back. And my ancestors built part of the Madurai Meenakshiman temple. And so I had taken him. He's been going there since he was like a few months old. And this time I took him alone because he finished his high school exam. And I took him with me. And as we were walking by, I just showed him a carving, you know, a stone inscription that says, that was put in in 1963 when my grandfather did the renovation. And it talks about his ancestor who built this tower like 500 or 700 years ago. So he said, how come you've just shown me first time? You know, so in, in that sense, I think I had a destiny. I had the great joy and luxury of doing 30 years of other things in other places. And now I'm back doing what was my duty to do to my legacy. So, you know, you, you've said that just in this few years that you've been a finance minister, you, you know, you said you want to leave a system which does not depend upon an MIT topper being there, but that the system will be designed well enough to work well without it being personality centric. That's wonderful to hear in this culture of personality. But uh, you said you've already made profound changes. What are the changes you've made? Well, I think, uh, you know, the constitution is designed very well, actually, you know, because it's through trial and error, and you know, the British had this constitution, unwritten one for a while. We Can everybody ours. hear him at the back? Yeah, we modeled ours on theirs. So there are checks and balance in, inherent in the constitution. You know, there's what you have to go to the legislature for, what is the role of the judiciary, where does audit and accounting and all fit in. And you know, I'm, I'm only talking about my little corner of the government, which is or maybe a big corner of the government, which is finance. And I'm also the minister for planning, development, personnel, administrative reforms, statistics, a whole bunch of administrative stuff. So those things are actually designed well in the constitution. The problem is they're not executed as the constitution has designed them. In multiple ways, I will say profoundly that the role of the legislature has been kind of you know, greatly dissolved or diluted through the Anti-Defection Act and a lot of the party-centric, leader-centric kind of culture that has seeped in. The same way, the role of the judiciary is not at all clear. I see hundreds of files where it's not clear to me that the judiciary and the administration, where that line should be, is, you know, firm. A lot of times they cross this way, a lot of times we cross that side. So I think we are trying to re-establish the system and the design in the constitution. And that starts with a lot of technology and a completely different approach. So from real-time data to monitoring of public sector enterprises to a separate audit function, internal audit, creating, I think for the first time in India, created a job called Director General of Audit inside the finance department removed all the self-auditing that departments were doing, put it into a central place, set up an advisory committee of retired judges, lawyers to help us on litigation management. Things that large corporates got right 40 or 50 years ago in terms of systems design, alignment of incentives, you know, accountability, real-time data, data-based decision-making, all these things. It's, it's not rocket science. We're just pioneering it inside the government. Right. <clears throat> no, that, you know, it's, it's interesting that you're saying that because you're trying to bring a, like a corporate culture into government. Uh, corporate yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not even accountability. Accountability, right? Government. I mean, yeah, I, every time, and, and I say this with a bit of trepidation, every time I try to do something and tell, somebody tells me, this is not corporate, this is politics. And I say, nowhere in politics does it say that I have to be stupid. Right? I, I, there, there's no requirement. I can still do intelligent things. That doesn't make it corporate. Right? So. <laughs> right. Well, one thing, you know, uh, I'll just share a little detail with you that Mr. Thyagrajan, when he first came into uh, politics and became a minister, was very outspoken. And then one of the learnings you've had, he said, is to become more, uh, you know, quiet, not pick up battles that you can't really fight. So, and to become much more circumspect, you know, so 
that's a bit of a loss for our public life. Well, I don't know. It's a, it's a challenge every day, right? Um, in the sense, of course, I want to speak up when I see the quality of our democracy decline or the nature of actions be one-sided. But then, unfortunately, my day job is to run my departments, deliver the finances, make sure my chief minister's vision gets implemented. And whether I like it or not, that requires me to work very closely with the union government in multiple ways. And, and to, be, uh, to be fair, they have treated me, at least at the individual level, at the ministers, at the secretary, they treat me with great uh, you know, mutual respect. I get access, I get appointments whenever I ask. More often than not, if they're reasonable, us, they get done. So uh, it's much harder having your own personality when you're in government. Right? When you're in opposition, it's your day job to rant and rave at the system. <laughs> uh, when you're in government, uh, you have to figure out uh, which is the greater good. Now, that's a very slippery slope, right? Because you could easily be lulled into doing nothing convincing yourself it's the greater good. But, you know, it's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a fine balance. Right. So, you know, you, you mentioned about your chief minister's vision. I was waxing eloquent about Tamil Nadu, and I'm going to show some teeth afterwards, but I'm going to give you a free run for a bit, which is that it is astonishing that a, industri a state which is very industrialized, we've been showing some statistics on the screen, are fantastic, you know, as you said, 4% pov poverty, 73% of female literacy, 1 million establishments run led by women, uh, you know, uh, infant mortality rate, which is fantastic. Kerala has just uh, 7 per 1,000, which is equivalent to America. Tamil Nadu has 15. Uttar Pradesh has 45, 48. Madhya Pradesh, you know, th that's stark differences. Yeah. So what is it that ideologically the Dravidian movement got right, you know? Is it that your DMK government is getting it right? Or is this a bipartisan thing that Tamil Nadu got right? This is something the Dravidian movement got right going back to 1921. In the first Justice Party government after uh, Dayaki, after the Montague Chelmsford reforms, I think within the first two years they enacted the right for women to vote, compulsory elementary education for boys and girls of all communities. Uh, reservation in government jobs based on the percentage of the population that each community was. Uh, nationalization of the king's temples and step by step, uh, all communities could be trustees, then, you know, the, the language could... And then if every one of these, if I take, from education to social inclusion to empowerment of women, it is not even just the Dravidian movement, because if, if you know the history, from 20 to 37, there was some version of the Dravidian movement. From 37 to 67, absent the years there was no election and government because of protests against the war and all that. It was mostly a Congress or a Swatantra uh, uh, through Rajaji's government. And then from 67 to now, it's been a self-professed Dravidian party, either the DMK or the ADM. Throughout this 100 plus years, this focus on inclusion, on education, on social justice has not wavered. In fact, uh, Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi, who you know, very eminent uh, civil uh, service officer, former governor of West Bengal, the first time I met him, he told me that uh, in his assessment, the Congress of Madras Presidency and Madras State hewed closer to the Dravidian ideology than it did to the Congress of the rest of India, right? And, and uh, you know, we had some shared history because he's also the grandson of, uh, of Rajaji, and my grandfather and Rajaji were political rivals but close friends. So that, I think, is the reason. It takes 100 years to get this right. You do this through inclusion, through the empowerment of women, through ensuring access to all opportunities, to all segments of society. It's it's disruptive and inefficient in the short term. If I take communities that have not had access to education for a thousand years and say that they must get 10% of the jobs, surely I'm getting less than ideal candidates. But in 50 years or 30 years, what that does is it creates a pipeline. It creates 
uh, coattails. It creates a front runner who can help people from that village, from that community say, if he can be there, I can be too. If she can be there, I can be too. So this social engineering, and, and it's not unique to us, it's, it's probably longer for us than other people. But if you go and read a lot of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's books or a lot of the things they talk about in Singapore, they, they talk about this. They say you get the society right and the economic outcomes will follow. Right? It's, you, it's very hard for you to get the economic outcomes right directly. You engineer the society right and the outcomes follow. And I think that, you know, there's no uh, kind of, um, you know, unique claim of the DMK. This is all parties going back 100 plus years that got us to this place. So, you know, that's really interesting when, when you say this because that commitment to social inclusion, as you said, has been very wavering in other parts of the country. And recently, you know, uh, Neela Kantan wrote a book called The North Versus the South, which has uh, angered a lot of people in the central government because it uh, focuses on how the southern uh, states that really, particularly Tamil Nadu, Kerala, that really got committed to uh, human development is actually suffering for it now. And it, you point out, you've been speaking about the cost of development, you know, so could you share with the audience some really stark figures that capture that? And what is it that you're trying to say should happen? Uh, first, I'll let you in on an inside secret. I was Sorry. first asked to write that book. Sorry? I was first asked to write that <laughs> <Okay>. book. <laughs> and the day I got the offer, my, my friend Prashant Kishore happened to be with me. And he told me, he said, Tyaga, don't touch it. I said, why? <laughs> and he said, dude, you're just starting in politics. Who knows where you'll go? You say you don't want to go to Delhi, but one day you may have to. Why do you want to alienate people? putting things down on paper, so don't touch the book. And I declined, and it was a good decision. Uh, but now, of course, my, my name is on the cover. I have a blurb on the book. But I have a different take than Neil Gunton, right? My, my take is in every federal society, in every country, in, in every federation like the European Union, you always expect the better off to be net donors and the less well off to be net recipients happens. That's what it's a country for. Where we have a problem is if you take across time. If you take the last 25 years and the five finance commissions, you take a state like Tamil Nadu, at one point we used to be about seven, seven and a half percent of the country population, seven, seven and a half percent of the country's economy, and our devolution of the share of taxes that was given to all states, within that horizontal, I mean within that vertical cut, a horizontal cut was 7.5%. Now you fast forward 25 years. 25 years later, we are just under 6% of the population of 5.5-6%. We are, you know, depending on which statistic you take because all the numbers have been jumbled yeah, up, but somewhere between 8, 10% and 1.5% of the economy. And we get 4% of the devolution. So what that tells you, and I said this to Mr. N.K. Singh and the 15th Finance Commission when they came to Chennai because I was an opposition member then. I said, if your goal in these payments is to narrow the gap between the... That's what the money is for, right? It's supposed to take from the rich, give it to the less well-off, and make them come closer together in some measure, quality of life, access to education, job opportunity, something. If that is the case, then I say 25 years of transfers have been miserable failure, miserable failure. Because not only is the gap not narrowing, and incidentally, this happens and the gap narrows in China. They take money from the coast, give it to the hinterland, the gap narrows. They take, this happens in America, they take money from New York and California and give it to Kansas and Missouri, the gap narrows. It happens in Western Europe. They take it from the Germanys and, and Frances, they give it to the Portugals and Greece, the gap narrows. In our country, for 25 years, the gap has not narrowed, it has not stabilized, it is not just widening, it is accelerating in its widening. Right? That is to say, if I take, I think it was slightly dated statistics, 2019. 11. Per capita income in Tamil Nadu is double the national average like two lakh something. Per capita income Bihar is less than half the national average, 40,000 something. Average age in Bihar is 19. Average age in Tamil Nadu is 30 something. Average education in Bihar is elementary school dropout. Average education in Tamil Nadu is high school graduate. Total fertility rate in Bihar is 3.6 something. 
Tamil Nadu is 1.6, 1.7. How do we get such disparate outcomes after huge transfers of wealth? So, it is not the money, I've said it multiple times, it is not the money we begrudge because we're still growing well, we're okay. It is the lack of development in our fellow citizens in these other states that we say, why are we giving this money and you don't know how to make this happen. You don't know how to bring them up the curve. And in fact, in this 15th Finance Commission submission, I made the point that the formulas you use actually disincentivize development. Because you say, the more poor you are, you get more money. The, you know, the greater your population, you get more money. We, we were told, cut the population, right? That's what we reached. Yeah. I said, why don't you go other ways? If what we have learned in 100 years is inclusion and especially empowerment of women, why don't you go and say that your share will increase as first the percentage of girls who are in elementary school. Next time, the percentage of girls who are in middle school. Next time, the percentage of girls who get access to menstrual health and therefore complete high school. Next time, access to jobs. So, one of the statistics you didn't cite, 40% of all women employed in the manufacturing industry across all of India are in Tamil Nadu. 6% of the population, 40% of women employees. So, this is a guaranteed path to success. It's a guaranteed way to improve. Why don't you incentivize that? Instead of incentivizing, the poorer you are, the more money you get. But, you know, they haven't done anything yeah. about it, so. But, <clears throat> you know, there's another very sticky issue that's come up. Like you just said, it's not that, uh, you know, that you're begrudging. It's not that the rich states don't want to support the poor states because we are one country. But that political power is now being taken away from you, you know. So, in the next, when the, the delimitation happens and the Lok Sabha seats will increase, then the states that are not developing well are going to get politically more powerful. Already the fate of India lies in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, Two-thirds of the Lok Sabha seats are in the north. Uh, you know, and the, you, you've already said some of this, but for every one rupee you send to the center, you get 29 paise, Bihar gets seven rupees. You know, so you're, the, but when political power is taken away from you and given to others, then there's a real source of tension, right? So how are you, I mean, what is the discussion within governments about this? Um, listen, I have more profound you, you worries. You can drop your finance minister's hat for a moment. No, 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 I have more profound worries than money and representation and all that. I, I have a worry that if the country's kind of outcomes keep diverging this dramatically for any length of time, then this is not good for the unity of our country, right? Like if you start at independence, I don't think any state was better than any other state on any measure by more than two is to one. If you track that all the way till maybe 1990 liberalization, maybe it became three is to one, two and a half is to one, that's it. 1990 liberalization as globalization automatically increases and accelerates the rate of growth and uh, the wealth creation. But what it also does automatically is increase inequality. Unless you do something about it consciously, mathematically we can prove that free trade and removing of barriers will increase global GDP. It will also increase inequality. Now that has happened in India. Much of this separation of the haves and the have-nots has happened after 91, after 1991. So if we keep on going down this path, how is it viable that you're going to have, uh, you know, this kind of disparate trajectory? Uh, if you're smart, you think two, five, ten years ahead, right? Not just today. So that worries me a lot more. As far as the representation is concerned, the answer is very simple. Let the union government focus on, you know, currency stabilization, foreign affairs, the banking system, interstate commerce, etc., and devolve the rest of the powers down to the states and the local bodies, as is done in every other large country in the world. Either it was written that way into the constitution or it has happened as a function of the progression of the scale of the economy and the complexity of administration. All of these powers are devolved. That's in China. That's in America. This is, a, you know, it's not based on right or left. It's just simple administrative logic. No. Yeah. That is very hard for you to sit in Delhi and control the outcomes for 1.4 billion people. 
even if they were homogenous. But when they are this disparate, it's very hard for you to set policies and do all of this stuff sitting in one place. So, devolution will resolve a lot of problems about the short-term political imbalance. But there's a much bigger structural problem that worries me. And that's this increasing rate of divergence. How long is that sustainable? It's not, it's not a, you know, what do you say, comforting prospect. So that's a good entry point. And again, we're going to run out of time and I want to cover two, three more issues. It's a good entry point into the other big debate in our national life, which is just over the state of the economy. You know, I, as a journalist, I find it really dis disturbing that you just don't know which facts to believe in. You know, the, even statistics, data, facts, like everyone authoritatively tells you another truth. You know, we, our previous session, we were talking about being post-human. We are certainly in a post-truth era, you know. So I would like to understand from you, what is the truth, you know? And are you capable of saying the truth? Because the central government tells us, and indeed the IMF, the World Bank, Everyone says that India is the fastest growing economy in the world. Then you have Mr. Raghuram Rajan, who says that we are at a Hindu rate of growth. Then you have the RBI saying that there's going to be 7% GDP. Then you have people like you, Mr. Arvind Subramaniam, Raghuram again, and innumerable others pointing to our last GDP quarter being 4.1%. You know, it's like a bulbulaya. You just don't know whom to believe. Let, let me start let, with no, that. Let, let me do everybody a service here, right? <laughs> let, me, let me talk about some basic things. Uh, actually, I have a caveat. First, let me start by saying that the entire data measurement mechanism system is completely rotten. I have the standing to say that because by this measurement system made by somebody else, my chief minister, our government has delivered faster growth lower inflation and half the fiscal and uh, revenue deficit of the government of India. So after I do all of that, I still say the system is rotten, right? It's not like I'm sour grapes. I deliver, then I say it's bad data anyway. Now I say, we live in this age where like, you know, uh, I, let me give you some examples. I don't even know how to describe this kind of you know, two plus two is equal to four suddenly becomes a great thing of national pride, right? <laughs> we are the president of the G20. Is that a sign of anything? No, it goes by rotation. <laughs> Who got us into the G20? <laughs> what is this? Like you go around saying, oh, I'm president of the G20, right? Every year, every month we get a statement. Oh, we have record GST revenues. By the nature of inflation, and the fact that we have higher population and higher economy, unless you are failing every month, you should have a higher number. Why is that a great sense of pride? Like it's meaningless, right? It's just that's the way numbers work, right? I'll give you another example. They say, oh, we have the fastest rate of growth. There's something called a low base effect. No other country had the recession that we had when we had COVID. We went down minus 8% in real terms, not Tamil Nadu. We grew. This country went down. Now you say you have got the fastest growing economy. I ask a simple question. Go back and look at yourself three years ago and look at other countries two, three years ago. How far have you bounced back compared to how far down you went? So the spin machine is fantastic. It takes something like saying, you know, the sky is blue. And then we're all supposed to thump our chests and say, wow, what a great country we live in. The sky is blue. Right? I mean, basic facts. Just basic facts. Anybody like high school algebra will know that this is just the way the numbers go. Right? I, I, I don't understand why like, this becomes a huge deal. Right? Right. Well, you know, I, I do have to play devil's advocate because there's nobody here to combat what Fair you're enough. saying. So, uh, the, the alternative view of this is, and you know, if Mr. Amitabh Kant was sitting here or Neil Kant Mishra was sitting here or Sanya, Sanjeev Sanyal was sitting here, they would tell you, that in this entire time of tumult, which every nation has gone through, whatever decision-making, uh, you know, and we've moved away from discussing the economy, but I have to make this rebuttal. They would tell you that the way the government managed the economy is that they have created stability, that, uh, you know, India, by and large, uh, the inflation is kind of under control compared to other countries, 
that things have bounced back. Narega numbers have gone down. They managed is to… Is Narega numbers going down, is that a good or a bad thing? I don't know. <laughs> I would say it's a bad thing, right? You, you are doing poverty alleviation. If your numbers don't even go up by the scale of inflation and the size of the economy, you're not doing a good thing. Why is that a bad… Yeah, why but Nilkan that... Mishra would also say that rural wages have gone up by 6%. Uh, l l l I, listen, was demonetization a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> was shutting down the economy on four hours notice and having millions of people walk around a good thing or a bad thing? Was the implementation of GST overnight, which we are still dealing with the fallout of that, a good thing or a bad thing? You cannot do all this, you know, there's, there's just no logic to this, right? You cannot, you cannot make this stuff up just because you say so, right? There has to be some, some, some number, some basis, some… Uh, listen, I… It's warm in Chennai. It's always warm in Chennai. Why should I take credit for that, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense to me, right? It, That's I, funny. I, I, I'll put it a different way. I'll put it a different way. I don't want to be a perma critic. I'm not worried about it. You know, politics is politics. Everybody will say what they want. I have a more real worry, and that's a worry I share with the union government, with the ministers of other states, etc. This ought to be India's moment, right? By the size of our population and the scale of our democracy and the fact that there is… And incidentally, globalization has happened multiple times in the past. It's not like a secular trend, it's cyclical. Right? There was great globalization in the days of the Roman Empire, then it all fragmented. There was great globalization in the age of colonialism, then it fragmented. How's the great globalization, hyper-globalization, now it's starting to fragment. But this situation is so ideal for India. Everybody wants to get out of China. They don't want concentration of risk. They don't want to have uncertainty of policy. They're looking for some other place. There's no other place in the world that has the human capital or the scale, or the potential for future kind of young workers as India has. This ought to be the time that we are growing at the 10% a year, I'm saying from like 5-7 years back to the next 10-15 years. Again, let's put that in context. In 1990, China and India had roughly the same per capita income, or per capita GDP, call it what you want. In fact, India was slightly ahead of China. By 2010, they were about three times as high as us. By now, they're probably five times as high as us. Now, the question is, this should have been our 10, 15, 20-year period when we were seeing 10% real growth compounded and we should have made that great leap. That opportunity cost bothers me. The politics is the politics. I worry that collectively we are not able to seize that opportunity. We should have been firing on all cylinders. We should have been growing 10% a year real. Factor in 4 or 5, 6% inflation, 15, 16% notional growth, nominal growth we should have had. We have not come close to that. That worries me because I don't think that window stays open permanently. Now, there are others who would argue. Uh, I don't want to name him because I don't want him to be associated with me. He's in the government very senior officer, he will argue that PTR is wrong. We're not actually losing any window of opportunity. You can grow at 7% for the next 30 years and get the equivalent outcome of growing at 10% for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years. Maybe, maybe. But I have a demographic problem. I got lots of youth who are without jobs. And if I can't accelerate the growth and provide the jobs, I am going to end up with social unrest even if it's not willfully created like some are doing now, right? <laughs> some are creating it now. But even if I didn't want to create it, it's going to be hard to suppress if I end up with a lot of disgruntled young people who don't see a bright future or don't see hope. So that worries me the most. The politics is the politics. Let them say what they want. Right. Okay. Uh, well, you know, we'll have to close soon. So I just want to pose two questions to you. One, in the spirit of ignition, uh, is there anything that you think that the central government is really getting right? You know, I've given you a lot of opportunity to say what Tamil Nadu has got right. They would say that they have really accelerated digitization, that, uh, you know, it's, the India stack is something that other countries want to emulate. And of course, it's, an, it's, a, it's a work in progress, you know, and they are, the digital divide is very scary. So I'll put that aside, but would you accept that there's yeah, any, I mean, or, uh, the, or the green transition, 
Do you think they're getting yeah, this I right? The green, I'm not so sure, but the digital, I agree. I was on a platform with uh, Amitabh Kant uh, a couple of weeks ago. I, but I must say that the RBI's interbank and, and payment systems were probably superior to the US as a banker when I came back in 2006 or 7 itself, and they have continued to be more um, customer focused and responsive since then. Uh, the digital stack has done a good job. Yes, there has been a great increase in the volume of transactions, but again, I would caveat that with the fact that cash in circulation is now twice what it was at the date of, I mean, by volume of cash in circulation, monetary value is twice what it was in demonetization. So, you know, we have to take it with a pinch of salt. And again, good is good. We could have done other things that made it great because we still have a digital divide. And I say, even in Tamil Nadu, where we have probably higher internet penetration than most places, we still have a lot of people who are not able to access services digitally, let alone make payments digitally. So in our government, for example, we've taken what we call the barbell approach. So 90% we want to do online, the 10% we send the government to people's homes rather than expecting the people to come to the government. So whether it is uh, basic medication for chronic diseases, whether it is remedial education in every block, whether it is uh, pension life certificates at their house uh, through the post bank. You know, now we have said the government will run camps to provide all the services in every village instead of, so I, I'm, you know, I, every time I speak in the assembly, I say I'm not interested in building any more treasuries and any more, you know, uh, tasildar offices and, and uh, collectorates and all that. We, we got to go online. Even there, we have a certain population that is not included. Now imagine what that is in places like UP or Bihar. So I think we have a lot more to do. I, 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 clearly, they have done some. Could they have done a lot more? Uh, in my opinion, they could have, because if demonetization had been done right, meaning with advance notice, with proper planning, with uh, education, with lead time on buying machines, with if it had been done right, it could have yielded that massive step change that could have accelerated us three or five times faster. And I just gave an, uh, a comparison to Mr. Kant, he couldn't deny it at the time. I said, you know, when I was a banker, one of the countries we used to operate was in Kenya. And in Kenya, they brought... Was it? Kenya, Kenya. They brought out this... Vodafone brought out this online payment system called M-Pesa, right, which was mobile money. I think something like 60% of the entire transaction flow of the country went on to M-Pesa within like four years. That's how rapidly transformation is possible. So we have done well, we could do better. So I'm just going to take one question and then one more and we're going to stop, have dinner outside. There's Vedant Kabra who's saying, give us top three suggestions of what the central government could do to move towards the kind of utopia that you've been describing? First, I would say, let, let a thousand voices be heard. Right? The first thing you need is debate. There's not one view, there's not always the best view. The first thing you should do is enable the best feature of democracy, let there be a vivid debate on ideas, and then the best one get chosen rather than somebody dictate. That's one. The second, I think, is somewhere between dele delineation of roles, ensuring the strength of independent institutions, like I'm trying to do in Tamil Nadu, and kind of getting government out of the way of kind of excessive regulation. So, you know, deregulate, delimit, or, you know, uh, uh, kind of designate who should do what and let the institutions act independently instead of all follow one way. And the last thing I would say is devolve, right? It's very hard to execute programs. Let's take flagship programs like Swachh Bharat. Till the days when CAG reports still used to cover these things, which now they've been silenced. But you go and read those reports. Now that's central money, sometimes going through the state, sometimes bypassing the state, going to the local body where they build the toilet. Great. Who supplies water to the toilet? Not the union government, right? Has to be the local body. How many toilets are without water, either at inception or six months or one year later? Now you've got this building program where you say there's a standardized model, everybody should do the same thing, everything should come from there. Take the, the school, school improvement program, I forget what it was, there was CES. They gave money for whitewashing schools. 
a lot of places, they didn't have buildings that were whitewashable. Right? So they didn't use the money. So you've just allocated this money. And, and we have the same problem the union has, that many years the money we allocate doesn't get spent. That's a failure of the people's intent expressed through the legislature and the executive, and we're not able to get the job done. That's true for all of us at some level. But it's much more likely to be successful if it's done by the corporation of Madurai or the panchayat of a village, because they know and they are held accountable by their people. It's much less likely by the time you come to the state of Tamil Nadu and my 250,000 or 300,000 voters are not going to be able to get to me as easily. And then it becomes almost impossible if the program is implemented from Delhi. And you have all of like, you know, one and a half million union government employees trying to implement programs across 1.4 billion people and a vast area. So I think devolution down to the lowest level, not just to the state, down to the local bodies where democracy truly functions. You know, in my, in my constituency, every councillor has about seven or 8,000 voters. There is a direct accountability between the councillor of the corporation of Madurai and the voters. The further up you come from that, there's no accountability. That's what we need, is more accountability. Yeah. So, you know, it's been a very thought-provoking and, and entertaining conversation. But I just want to end on the idea of democracy. You know, it's been under a lot of debate. I'm not going to lead you down that very interesting path. But uh, I just want to ask you one thing, which is that there's a lot of criticism and critique, and I think justified critique, about the personality cults and the, you know, you've been talking about it structurally. But that actually, in all fairness, is a criticism that could be leveled to your party, to Mamta Banerjee's party, to the Congress party. It's, it's a malaise that just runs across, you know. You yourself would never say anything against your chief minister. No one says anything against their chief ministers. Everybody is loyal to a fault and subservient to a fault. And it's, we, we masquerade as a parliamentary democracy. We're actually a presidential democracy, even at the state levels. So, in Tamil Nadu, you've always had these towering characters, you know, from Jaya Lalita to the DMK to all of that. It's been personality cult. You began the conversation by saying you're a systemic changer. What is it you would so? I, like I said, I won't give you the stage to critique the center. It would be fun, but no, no, what no, would I, you do? Listen, I, 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 can't, I can't deny the truth. I can't say that, you know, I, I mean, I hope at least that's what separates me from most people. My, my values and my views stay the same, whether I'm in opposition or in government and, and I'm talking about the city or the state or the country. So if you ask me, has there been a growing cult kind of politicization? The answer is obviously yes. I would say in the course of Tamil Nadu at least, between the DMK and the ADMK, for most people here they can validate, it was always much more democratic within the DMK, for good or bad reasons, than the ADMK, and again, for good or bad reasons. Ms. Jalata had a fair share of reasons to be the way she was. I can only speak for myself. I can say that in less than two years that I have been finance minister, I must have processed 7,000 files or something, done one amended budget and two full budgets, covering I don't know, 10 lakh crores. Uh, and brought in, in my view, more reform, and most people would validate that in the last less than two years than in 20 years before that. 100% of this was enabled by my chief minister giving me that much room to operate based on my capability and my insight and my talent and my conviction. If he had said, sign the file, wherever he says, I sign. But till now, he's not called me once on one file. Because of that, I'm able to deliver what I can deliver. So, while I broadly agree with you that the cult of leadership or a cult-like leadership is not in the best interest of democracy, in my particular case, 100% of what I've been able to do is because my leader gave me a job to do and then left me alone to do it, right? So, I, I, I can only speak of my experience and say that he has been the, the, the best you know, and in, in, on, I, I, on, 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 you no, 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 on, 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 on record in the assembly, I have said, listen carefully to the words I'm saying. I said, he gave me the job, 
he gives me encouragement he gives me support he gives me protection what kind of protection should the finance minister of a state require contemplate that and yet i put on the record he gives me protection therefore i do my job so sure. well you know as as i said there's in particularly conversations like this there are other missing pieces because there would be uh, combative positions to what you're saying uh, nirmala sitaraman would probably say she's been given the protection to play out her role as as uh, you know she sees fit but i was really asking you that in a systemic way how can we fix democracy and you said something very important which is put competent people in their in particular chairs and then give them the freedom to do it you know no actually this is a very important point again i mean many times people tell me oh it's great that we have educated competent people all that i mean nowhere in democracy is that the criteria right at the end of the day the most important quality for a politician in my opinion is compassion is humanity right everything else comes second to that you can be better educated less educated it helps to do a job if you have a specialist background but the core of it should be that you care about the upliftment of the poor and the weak and to have a more harmonious and equitable society if the people are smart enough they vote for that if they otherwise think about other things they would do other things and then they get outcomes related to that so i i am very reluctant to start down a path in a democracy by having additional or artificial kind of variables like extent of qualification or specialization anything like that i agree that competence is a close second to compassion that right? you want to actually run a good government and this is all departments not just mine to me the hallmarks of good governance are compassion and then competence and execution ability you say you're going to do something actually get it done that's not a trivial thing right very very many places we are not able to get we collectively all governments are not able to get done what we say we get done because the system is that broken there's no other system in the world where you don't have enough information you don't have institutional memory you don't have proper systems like data and continuity people get transferred all the time supposedly the civil service is the steel frame with all the you know continuity but they get changed in jobs every 2 3 years you can't really incentivize people through rewards you can't promote them faster than schedule you cannot give them special bonuses you can't do anything you cannot really threaten them because even were you to take action it will take you 10 years and go through five court cases so how do you run a system where you don't have any levers of control inadequate information and no continuity or institutional memory that's a huge skill that's the real test of a successful politician of a successful administrator of course if we improve the system it shouldn't require that much skill so we're trying to do both we get it done manually now and build the platform so that it becomes more automatic later thank you very very much mr tyagrajan uh really for that you getting a standing ovation that's amazing <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> that's really nice thank you for being such a brilliant audience i mean this message you left us with compassion uh, you know even more than competence compassion and you said may a thousand wo voices speak uh, this is a platform where at least several voices have spoken and thank you very very much mr tyagrajan everybody please join us outside in the lawn for dinner and drinks and more conversation and thank you very much to shivnather foundation bmw shivas uh, brand avatar dlf and all of you for being such a fantastic audience thank you very much <laughs>